Chapter 1, Part 7 of The Colored Patriots of the American Revolution by William Cooper Nell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The Colored Patriots of the American Revolution. Chapter 1, Continued. Massachusetts. Phyllis Wheatley was a native of Africa, and was brought to this country in the year 1761, and was sold as a slave. She was purchased by Mr. John Wheatley, a respectable citizen of Boston. This gentleman, at the time of the purchase, was already the owner of several slaves, but the females in his possession were getting something beyond the active periods of life, and Mrs. Wheatley wished to obtain a young negress, with the view of training her up under her own eye, that she might, by gentle usage, secure to herself a faithful domestic in her old age she visited the slave market that she might make a personal selection from the group of unfortunates for sale there she found several robust healthy females exhibited at the same time with phyllis who was of a slender frame and was evidently suffering from change of climate she was however the choice of the lady who acknowledged herself influenced to this decision by the humble and modest demeanor and the interesting features of the little stranger. The poor, naked child, for she had no other covering than a quantity of dirty carpet about her, like a philobeg, was taken home in the chaise of her mistress, and comfortably attired. She is supposed to have been about seven years old at this time, from the circumstance of shedding her front teeth. She soon gave indications of uncommon intelligence, and was frequently seen endeavoring to make letters upon the wall, with a piece of chalk or charcoal. A daughter of Mrs. Wheatley, not long after the child's first introduction to the family, undertook to learn her to read and write, and, while she astonished her instructress by her rapid progress, she won the good will of her kind mistress by her amiable disposition and the propriety of her behavior. She was not devoted to menial occupations, as was at first intended, nor was she allowed to associate with the other domestics of the family, who were of her own color and condition but was kept constantly about the person of her mistress. She does not seem to have preserved any remembrance of the place of her nativity, or of her parents, excepting the simple circumstance that her mother poured out water before the sun at its rising, in reference, no doubt, to an ancient African custom. As Phyllis increased in years, the development of her mind realized the promise of her childhood, and she soon attracted the attention of the literati of the day, many of whom furnished her with books. These enabled her to make considerable progress in belle lettres, but such gratification seems only to have increased her thirst after knowledge, as is the case with most gifted minds, not misled by vanity, and we soon find her endeavoring to master the Latin tongue. She was now frequently visited by clergymen and other individuals of high standing in society, but, notwithstanding the attention she received and the distinction with which she was treated, she never for a moment lost sight of that modest, unassuming demeanor, which first won the heart of her mistress in the slave market. Indeed, we consider the strongest proof of her worth, to have been the earnest affection of this excellent woman, who admitted her to her own board. Phyllis ate of her bread, and drank of her cup, and was to her as a daughter, for she returned her affection with unbounded gratitude, and was so devoted to her interests, as to have no will in opposition to that of her benefactress. In 1770, at the age of sixteen, Phyllis was received as a member of the church worshipping in the old South Meeting House, then under the pastoral charge of the Reverend Dr. Sewell. She became an ornament to her profession, for she possessed that meekness of spirit which, in the language of inspiration, is said to be above all price. She was very gentle-tempered, extremely affectionate, and altogether free from that most despicable foible, which might naturally have been her besetting sin, literary vanity. The little poem commencing, quote, "'Twas mercy brought me from my heathen land," end quote, will be found to be a beautiful expression of her religious sentiments, and a noble vindication of the claims of her race. We can hardly suppose anyone, reflecting by whom it was written, an African and a slave, to read it without emotions both of regret and admiration. Phyllis never indulged her muse in any fits of sullenness or caprice. She was at all times accessible. If anyone requested her to write upon any particular subject or event, she immediately set herself to the task, 
and produced something upon the given theme. This is probably the reason why so many of her pieces are funeral poems, many of them, no doubt, being written at the request of friends. Still, the variety of her compositions affords sufficient proof of the versatility of her genius. We find her, at one time, occupied in contemplation of an event, affecting the condition of a whole people, and pouring forth her thoughts in a lofty strain. Then the song sinks to the soft tones of sympathy, in the affliction occasioned by domestic bereavement. Again, we see her seeking inspiration from the sacred volume, or from the tomes of heathen lore, now excited by the beauties of art, and now hymning the praises of nature, to nature's God. On one occasion we notice her, a girl of but fourteen years, recognizing a political event, and endeavoring to express the grateful loyalty of subjects to their rightful king, not as one, indeed, who had been trained to note the events of nations by a course of historical studies, but one whose habits, taste, and opinions were peculiarly her own. For in Phyllis we have an example of originality of no ordinary character. She was allowed, and even encouraged, to follow the leading of her own genius, but nothing was forced upon her, nothing suggested or placed before her as a lure. Her literary efforts were altogether the natural workings of her own mind. There is another circumstance respecting her habits of composition, which peculiarly claims our attention. She did not seem to have the power of retaining the creations of her own fancy, for a long time, in her own mind. If, during the vigil of a wakeful night, she amused herself by weaving a tale, she knew nothing of it in the morning, it had vanished in the land of dreams. Her kind mistress indulged her with a light, and, in the cold season, with a fire, in her apartment during the night. The light was placed upon a table at her bedside, with writing materials, that if anything occurred to her after she had retired, she might, without risking or taking cold, secure the swift-winged fancy ere it fled. By comparing the accounts we have of Phyllis's progress with the dates of her earliest poems, we find that she must have commenced her career as an authoress, as soon as she could write a legible hand, and without being acquainted with the rules of composition. Indeed, we very much doubt if she ever had any grammatical instruction, or any knowledge of the structure or idiom of the English language, except what she imbibed from the perusal of the best English writers, and from mingling in polite circles, where, fortunately, she was encouraged to converse freely with the wise and the learned. We gather from her writings that she was acquainted with astronomy, ancient and modern geography, and ancient history, and that she was well versed in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. She discovered a decided taste for the stories of heathen mythology, and Pope's Homer seems to have been a great favorite with her. The reader is already aware of the delicate constitution and frail health of Phyllis. During the winter of 1773, the indications of disease had so much increased that her physician advised a sea voyage. This was earnestly seconded by her friends, and a son of Mr. and Mrs. Wheatley, being about to make a voyage to England to arrange a mercantile correspondence, it was settled that Phyllis should accompany him, and she accordingly embarked in the summer of the same year. She was at this time but nineteen years old, and was at the highest point of her short and brilliant career. It is with emotions of sorrow that we approach the strange and splendid scenes which we're now about to open upon her, to be succeeded by grief and desolation. Phyllis was well received in England, and was presented to Lady Huntington, Lord Dartmouth, Mr. Thornton, and many other individuals of distinction. But, says our informant, quote, not all the attention she received, nor all the honors that were heaped upon her, had the slightest influence upon her temper or deportment. She was still the same single-hearted, unsophisticated being. End quote. During her stay in England, her poems were given to the world, dedicated to the Countess of Huntington, and embellished with an engraving, which is said to have been a striking representation of the original. It is supposed that one of these impressions was forwarded to her mistress as soon as they were struck off, for a grand niece of Mrs. Wheatley informs us that, during the absence of Phyllis, she one day called upon her relative, who immediately directed her attention to a picture over the fireplace, exclaiming, quote, See, look at my Phyllis. Does she not seem as though she would speak to me? End quote. Phyllis arrived in London so late in the season that the great mart of fashion was deserted. She was, therefore, urgently pressed by her distinguished friends 
to remain until the court returned to St. James, that she might be presented to the young monarch, George the Third. She would probably have consented to this arrangement, had not letters from America informed her of the declining health of her mistress, who entreated her to return, that she might once more behold her beloved protégé. Phyllis waited not a second bidding, but immediately re-embarked for that once happy home, soon after made desolate by the death of her affectionate mistress. She soon after received an offer of marriage from a respectable colored man of Boston. The name of this individual was Peters. He kept a grocery in Court Street, and was a man of handsome person. He wore a wig, carried a cane, and quite acted out the gentleman. In an evil hour, he was accepted, and, though he was a man of talents and information, writing with fluency and propriety, and at one period reading law, he proved utterly unworthy of the distinguished woman who honored him by her alliance. See footnote. Begin footnote. For this account of Phyllis Wheatley, I am principally indebted to a compilation from the original memoir published by Mr. George W. Light, and understood to have been written by Mrs. Margareta Matilda O'Dell. End quote. The following letter, written by General Washington in reply to a communication sent to him by Phyllis, will be read with the deepest interest. The letter may be found in Sparks's Life of Washington. Cambridge, Massachusetts, February 28, 1776. Miss Phyllis, your favor of the 26th of October did not reach my hands till the middle of December. Time enough, you will say, to have given an answer ere this. Granted, but a variety of important occurrences, continually interposing to distract the mind and withdraw the attention, I hope will apologize for the delay, and plead my excuse for the seeming, but not real, neglect. I thank you most sincerely for your polite notice of me, in the elegant lines you enclosed, and, however undeserving I may be of such encomium and panegyric, the style and manner exhibit a striking proof of your poetical talents, in honor of which, and as a tribute, justly due to you. I would have published a poem, had I not been apprehensive, that while I only meant to give the world this new instance of your genius, I might have incurred the imputation of vanity. This, and nothing else, determined me not to give it place in the public prints. If you should ever come to Cambridge, or near headquarters, I should be happy to see a person so favored by the muses, and to whom nature has been so liberal and beneficent in her dispensations." I am, with great respect, your obedient, humble servant, George Washington. As a preface to the edition of Mrs. Wheatley's poems, published in Boston about 1770, I find this card from the publisher. To the public. As it has been repeatedly suggested to the publisher, by persons who have seen the manuscript, that numbers would be ready to suspect they were not really the writings of Phyllis, he has procured the following attestation from the most respectable characters in Boston, that none might have the least ground for disputing their original. We whose names are underwritten do assure the world that the poems specified in the following page were, as we verily believe, written by Phyllis, a young negro girl who was, but a few years since, brought an uncultivated barbarian from Africa, and has ever since been, and now is, under the disadvantage of serving as a slave in a family in this town. She has been examined by some of the best judges, and is thought qualified to write them. His Excellency Thomas Hutchinson, Governor. The Honorable Andrew Oliver, Lieutenant Governor. The Honorables Thomas Hubbard, John Irving, James Pitts, Harrison Gray, and the Honorable James Bowdoin. John Hancock, Esquire. Joseph Green, Esquire. Richard Carey, Esquire. The Reverends Charles Chauncey, Mather Biles, Ed Pemberton, Andrew Elliot, Samuel Cooper, Samuel Mather, and the Reverend John Moorhead, and Mr. John Wheatley, her master. End of chapter 1, part 7.